Welcome to Speak Out. I'm Sandy Galef, a member of the New York State Assembly representing parts of Northern Westchester and parts of Putnam County. And I, you know, end up going to a lot of meetings talking about veterans issues and the concerns that we have for people that have been in the military and have come back to our area and certainly have some issues that they have to deal with. And uh, today we're going to be talking about a vet to vet program that is relatively new, uh, that is so important for our communities. And I've invited two very special guests to be with me. One is John Borges, who is the program coordinator for the vet to vet program. Thank you Welcome, John. Thank you for having me. And Carl it. Rohde, who is the director of the Putnam County Veterans uh, Service Agency in Putnam County. Welcome, Carl. Thank you. And again, thank you for having us here. In, um Getting veterans' issues out is just so important. Right, and and we know that uh, in in Putnam County you have this legislative Le event legislative forum, and yeah, for, forum, legislative forum, yeah. Right, yeah. and and you're discussing all the veterans' issues um, that really make us as legislators think about what we're doing in Albany and how we can be helpful, or what we can do on a county level, local level, uh, because you have everybody right. there. Yeah, yeah. Right. And it's us telling you guys what we need. Right. And everybody's very verbal. Yeah. <laughs> they have lots to say, yeah. which is which is really very good. And John, you're coordinating this this relatively new program, yes, a four year old program. Tell us a little bit about how it started. Um, it started a few years ago um, in Suffolk County as being one of the first four counties. It's named after Joseph P. Dwyer, who was a combat medic in Iraq in 2003. When he came home, he was suffering from PTSD, substance abuse, depression, and was self-medicating him, himself. And that ended up uh, leading to his accidental overdose. Um, they realized that the best time that Joe Dwyer was Joe Dwyer was when he was just with other veterans. He didn't mm -hmm. have to be a member of anything. He didn't have to show a card to come in. It, there was no uh, uh, regulations. There were no rules. And basically, it was just one veteran dealing with another veteran, giving them support. And they came up with the idea with a peer support program. And the peer support mm -hmm. program works in all aspects of life. If you think of AA or uh, Weight Watchers, uh, you know, you're dealing with somebody who's walked the walk and is going through the exact same process that you're going through. Nobody's there to say you're broken. Nobody's there to say that there's something wrong with you. We're this there to be a support. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so they created the program, started in four counties. It's been so successful. It's now in 16 counties in New York State, and I'm fortunate that I run the program in, in Putnam County. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been running the program for about two to three years, and it's been in existence for about four years, I think, right. when they got the funding. Now, do you have just veterans from Putnam, or are you finding that you're pulling in veterans from we don't, turn any, we don't turn anybody away. Um, it's one of those things that th there are programs that are similar to ours. Each one of the counties was allowed to design their program that fit their county. Mm -hmm. So my program is different than the county that would be in Orange County, but there is a Dwyer Vet to Vet program in Suffolk, in Nassau, in Westchester, Orange, Duchess, um, and Rockland. And mm -hmm. we don't turn anyone away. Um, we deal with people in Orange County and Duchess County but we also refer them to the other uh, Dwyer programs just because they're closer to them and mm -hmm. might be able to give mm -hmm. them more support. But we have, as an example, a 24-hour uh, warm line, which allows a veteran to be able to call in to speak to another veteran just to mm -hmm. get support and see if we can help them. And we don't deny anyone access to that mm -hmm. number. You can call mm -hmm. from anywhere. So, um, Carl, how do, you, you're, you're the head of the Putnam County uh, Veterans Agency. Now, when people come to you, do, be, do people call you on the phone? Do they, they stop by the office? I, I have How both. I have walk-ins, people with appointments, just calling us on the phone, yeah. I have all, all three. A um, lot of walk-ins just, just has increased recently. Mm -hmm. um, do you... How... Do you, do you do a lot of referrals to the vet to vet program, or yeah, yes. how, do, how do you work out who's, well, who's if, going if, where? Well, if I get a young vet in, or not even a young vet, it can be a World War II veteran, it can be a Vietnam veteran, that I think doesn't necessarily need clinical help, but needs to be around some other veterans, needs um, some one-on-one um, -on -one therapy. We, we you know, um, I'll refer them over to, to um, John at Vet to Vet. Mm -hmm. We even have one of the, one of the Vet to Vet um, coordinator. Well, I don't know what his actual title is, but peer support peer specialist. support specialist also mm -hmm. works for me, so I have a direct connection with the peer support. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, we we stay in. 
I think John and I talk about every day, mm -hmm. uh, something one way or the other about these type of issues. Mm -hmm. you know, veterans. You so know. let's talk about what some of the major issues that come in. I don't know whether we could actually categorize them. Are there are, are people coming in because they're addicted to drugs? Um, get, are they everything. coming in? You know, what what it's, are it's the major issues? One of the things that we've done is is in order to sort of cast it. One of the first things that has to happen is that people have to be able to trust you. They have to understand mm -hmm. that you're there not to criticize them, not to point out their faults, not to say anything about them, but to try and create a sense of support. And we do that through social events, whether it's bowling, baseball games, uh, movies, or we've gone to Shakespeare and Boscobel, but it's an opportunity for one veteran to be socializing with other veterans to create a network. And, and through that network, then people realize who we are and, and where we are and what we do and we end up getting a phone call in the middle of the night about dealing with a young veteran who has substance abuse problems and trying to assist them and getting them into Montrose. Uh, or they might be at Putnam County Jail and we've gone and met them there. Um, they might have alcohol abuse problems and again trying to get them connected with a social worker that's over at Montrose or in Bronx VA, whichever works for them, um, but then also to support the family as well. So all of these things, they may have alcohol problems, they may have substance abuse problems, but it may be stemming from PTSD. It may be from MST, which is military sexual trauma. It's, uh, there, there's a whole host of reasons that sort of separates them, um, puts them in a separate category, um, but it's all inclusive. So you can mm -hmm. say that they have an alcohol problem, but there might be something else that's underlying that. Right. Um, and so it's an opportunity that's beyond my pay grade. That's mm -hmm. why we don't do the counseling. We're not mm -hmm. there to counsel. We're merely there to try and be uh, uh, support services for them, to be mm -hmm. peers, mm -hmm. Um, and to be advocates for them. So you say you can't counsel, because that's not your role. Your My role, role is, is not to, to, not counsel. to counsel. And again, I, we might, during the course of a, as a conversation, explain that this is how I went through my problems. This is how I dealt with my issues. Um, would this be something that you might think of? Um, right. But again, it's not to say you have to follow me. The most I can do, and Carl mm -hmm. and I have had this conversation before, is open the door for you and it's up to them to be able to walk through it. Mm -hmm. So you have to, if, if somebody comes to you, Carl, which you say they do, you have to um, kind of figure out what, what is the best mechanism? Well, the, the, first of all, the majority of people that come to me because I'm a certified VA service officer mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to help, usually they're coming to me to try and get some benefits compensation from the VA. Right, so, so it's it's money, resources. Resources, so. me med medical, getting into the VA hospital. Right. So a lot of times they'll, they'll open up to me about a whole host of problems. Mm -hmm. I have to try and, you know, work through that and see some of them, you know, that it's the best way I can do. I, I try to avoid when I have a veteran, especially post-traumatic stress disorder, um, MST, whatever it is, having them go to the VA where they're just going to be given drugs. We'd rather have almost any other type of way to help these veterans than, mm -hmm. than to get another prescription. Although they can go to the VA for help and we wouldn't mm -hmm. tell them not to. We mm -hmm. offer, like John said, the, the, just a, just an ear to listen, a shoulder right. to lean on. Right. Um, we refer them to uh, equestrian services, refer mm -hmm. them to um, mm -hmm. um, getting service dogs. Uh, we've even had uh, ladies come in that are, have offered free um, acupuncture to help relieve stress mm -hmm. uh, so a any anything that would avoid getting prescription drug is what we right. try to do it and, and we'll try almost anything you know um, and it you, works you, you mentioned the equestrian because I know um, up in um, Cold Spring there is an equestrian center I actually did a TV show Tough about that yes we've, we've worked with yes. top field in the past we've had a couple of events up in at top field um, we've also done some work recently with uh, stonewall which is another equestrian center in um, cold spring um, the equestrian centers are, are a, a, a great avenue of support um, one of the issues sometimes that becomes apparent is 
sometimes you have to follow a program because that's the way that the, the program is designed and it doesn't necessarily fit everyone. So what we were trying to come up with, and we're going to do it successfully with Stonewall, was to have veterans learn how to groom and take care of horses. And during the course of the learning how to groom and take care of horses, they get the therapy of being with horses, but at the end they also get a certificate that says that you know they're now trained by these individuals and they can help some of the stables uh, walking with horses, taking horses to do different things. But as we start to become known, um, we've dealt with, and Carl was very instrumental in helping me with, uh, a homeless veteran. Um, so believe it or not, there are homeless veterans in, in Putnam County. Oh, there are a whole lot of and, homeless and veterans. And so you, you find them, but again, how do you get them to come in? You first have to get their trust after you've earned their trust as to whether or not there's something that we can offer for them. But they may never have accessed the VA system. So that's why having a working relationship with Carl and Art and Kevin as the veteran so service officer. You, you might meet them someplace. Right. And then you you convince or suggest yep. or whatever that they go to Carl and find out in this particular what instance for housing yeah. and so on. They were living out of their car and we were able to get them to a hospital to get a checkup mm -hmm. um, to make sure that they were doing okay and we mm -hmm. had a conversation with Carl and we were able to get him into a residence and uh, he's now living there and one of the things that's great about the residence is that they're all veterans and so they all look out for each other. So individuals that have been there might not have been doing very well. It's the other veterans that are there that have called an ambulance for them to make sure that they're taken care of. So it, it's a, it, veterans take care of veterans. They support each other. It's part of their being that team again, of being able to give back to society, which is why looking at the equestrian center, learning how to take care of horses and to do the grooming, Many places like Stonewall and Topfield, they also take care of children with special needs. And this is an opportunity for a veteran to return to the community to give something back, and they've been trained to do something. Right. And it's no, it's, it's amazing. I, I never realized the, um, the horses, or I guess you could say almost any animal. Mm -hmm. Because I think, Carl, before you said something, did you say about other animals, or did I well, dogs, miss dogs, yeah, right? Dogs, yeah. Um, service dogs, and not even service dogs, but comfort dogs. Uh, just to have, it doesn't necessarily have to be a dog. It first started out with service dogs, mm -hmm. where they would help a, a, a veteran. We, we had one case uh, where the, the, the dog would help the um, young man, they had a young baby, would go and open up the refrigerator and get a bottle of milk out, get the, the baby's bottle out and bring it to him. But that's a service dog, but I think what we're getting more and more of is, is comfort dogs that just having the dog next to the veteran, it helps them relax. We've had um, a, as an example, we've had a veteran, what we're working at now is to get him a, a dog, not as a service dog, but as, as the comfort dog, because one of the problems is that you put yourself in the bunker, you stay in the bunker, but you know there's nobody else there that's gonna be able to help you and support you. There's no reason for you to come out. There's no reason for you to engage. But by having the dog, you now have somebody that you have to take care of, that you are now right. responsible for. Right. And it gets you to that point where you can now mm -hmm. cope a little bit more and deal a little bit more and mm -hmm. come out a little bit more. And as you start to come out a little bit more, well, maybe I can go to a ball game. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can go to a movie or maybe so I can go here. Sometimes you, you said you take people to ball games and mm -hmm. shows and so on. Is, is it hard to get people to say, yes, I will do Absolutely. this? Absolutely. Okay. You, right. you, if you think of you know, where would I rather be? I would rather be in my room, by myself, in my bunker, doing whatever I'm uh -huh. doing, whether it's uh, right. games, mm -hmm. drinking, drugs, whatever, I'm safe. I'm at risk when I am outside. So how do you bring people out to try and get away from that sort of what we would call cellar dwellers? How do, how do I get you out? And it's not to say, hey, there's something wrong with you, come with me because we're gonna fix you. I have a movie. You want to come to the movie? Come to the movie. We have a writing group. We want to learn how to write. The people that have, that have gone to the writing group have changed from just learning how to write simple things. People are now writing stories about growing up with their family and mental health issues that they never realized until now. Um, but it's an opportunity now to, you don't just come out and, and everything is laid in front of you. It's, it's a little step, small steps and small steps. And once they've gotten that trust, they trust Carl, they trust Art, 
now they can come out and maybe go to a ball game with their kids or see a movie with their grandchildren or we've gone and kayaking on Maypac. What a wonderful change. Yes. That can occur. Absolutely. Yeah. And when we started the ball game program three years, well, almost four years, three mm -hmm. years ago, this is our third season, we had 50 tickets. We were still trying to find people to come the day of the game. Now um, we went from 50 tickets to 75 tickets. The first day it was open for reservations. By two o'clock, we were booked. We had to get extra tickets because so many guys want to come. They want to come back again. Cause the, and we may, you may watch about five minutes of the ball game, uh -huh. but we, we feed them. Um, we have an ice cream bar at the end where everybody gets can fill up a dish and have ice cream with all kinds of toppings. And, and it's really great and they love it. And, and it, they're with other veterans, they're with other people, their kids get to interact with other kids. Especially in the spouses and the family members <laughs> yeah. get a chance to interact with each other. And it's a way of building a support network. Um, you know, it, it's not saying you have to do this. It's something that occurs on its own by just helping to put them together. Mm -hmm. And somebody hears about you and the next thing you know, you, you get a phone call. Right. So John, you had said that it, the whole concept really started not that many years ago of the veteran to veteran on a, on a national level or are we? I don't believe that it's on a national level. The ones that, I mean, Lee Zeldin was the state senator that started it and, and it's basically to my knowledge, um, you know, it's almost if, if you Google veteran services in almost any state, there's a lot of things that can pop up and how do you know that this program is endorsed, supported, is not, doing this for somebody else. Right. The New York State program, it's funded by the state. I have accountability to the state. But again, it's not, we're not saying that there's something wrong with you. I'm not the veteran service officer who has to be trained, who has to learn how to file the claims. We're merely peers. So how can I support you? And we're facilitators. If I can't get you the answer, I will find the person that can get you the answer. Right. I won't you know, necessarily be able to solve your problem, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I'm not going away. Right. And, right. you know, things might work out really well today. And I'm in contact with family members of veterans who are going through recovery. And that's just that they know there's somebody that they can call. Right. Things can do really, really well for a year. And then the next thing, a year later, they call. That's, that's so interesting because I, I had met somebody at the Yorktown Range Fair uh, that was selling uh, kitchen cabinets. I actually ended up getting some kitchen cabinets. But so I really kind of got to know him because he did some installation in my house. And then after September 11th, I got in my cabinets before, many years before September 11th. When that happened, he was on my answering machine in my office and just saying, I can't deal with it. And it was like the trigger. He'd never really said much before um, as, a, as a cabinet salesperson. But, but because of September happening, September 11th happening, he just, it triggered everything in his mind and left the message. I was able to talk with him afterwards. I wasn't in the office. It was, um, I, I think at that, but he must have called after we all went home. Um, it was a primary day actually. So, so I don't, I think my office was closed. Maybe that was what was going on. But anyway, I talked with him afterwards. He said he doesn't know what happened, but something really triggered him. And then he needed some different kind of services at that point. So that's what you're saying. You don't know necessarily when. Absolutely. I, 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 I tell people this and I have to be sort of candid is that uh, there used to be an old commercial and the commercial was not only am I a spokesperson for the hair club for men, I'm also a client. Um, it's one of those things that I've been diagnosed with PTSD, but it's, uh, the trigger for me was eight years after I came back from Iraq. Um, and it's something that the, you may deal with it and cope with it and then all of a sudden there's a trigger and then who do I call? Well, I don't want to necessarily call this person. I don't necessarily need to call the crisis line. Who can I just talk to? And that's one of the reasons why we started the warm line. And it was just an opportunity for somebody to be able to call and speak to another vet. And the veterans are trained, we are trained, um, not as crisis workers, but to understand you know, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Are you thinking of committing suicide? Um, where can I go? If this is a 911 call, um, what can I do to get you support services? Can I come over and you need somebody to bring you to the hospital? Um, all done with safety in mind. And the idea is to support them. And in many times, it's just having that 
conversation. You know, you, you, you have 9-11. I was a police officer in New York City for 20 years. Um, and 9-11 comes along. But 9-11 comes once a year. And right. every year right. there are individuals that were not only in the service after that, but were police officers. Um, and that's their trigger. Right. And, you know, you may right. be a, a memory of somebody that you were in the service with that was killed on a particular day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, June 23rd doesn't mean anything to anybody else except for you as the mm -hmm. day that mm -hmm. this is when your buddy was killed or right. something else. And, and the triggers are not necessarily watching a war movie. I mean, we were watch, I was watching something completely benign. You know, I think I sort of resigned myself that I can only watch cartoons and, and uh, Hanna-Barbera cartoons. And, you know, it just, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And because there's no rhyme or reason mm -hmm. to it, there's all these different answers that people are trying right. to come up with. There is no one size fits all. But we have access to all of these people. Right. We have, if, if Horses works for you, one of the people in Orange County, he's, we got him to deal with an equestrian unit that's down in Maryland. They're gonna pay the bill, they're gonna get him down to Maryland, and they're gonna take care of him for a week. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's just being that facilitator, can we help you, what can I do? Mm -hmm. And we don't reinvent the wheel each and every day. Right. You know, another thing, we, we try to do a lot of outreach where we set up information tables, information booths, and a lot of times we will talk to the veteran, ask the veteran how he's doing, and he walks away saying, everything's yeah. Two thumbs great. up, I'm, I'm right. 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 Then his wife, Says or, his, or, or uh, right. uh, it's a female veteran and uh -huh. her husband, the spouse comes and talks to us, and they say, no, not all right. Uh -huh. He needs, right. needs, and then then we'll try to engage them, and, and sometimes it's a slow process. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. sometimes it's it's a process that goes nowhere. We can't we can't reach everybody, mm -hmm. but we try to read. Like, like John, John would say, we're, we're trying to help one veteran at a time. If every day yep. we can help one veteran, we've been successful. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna, right. you know, we're not gonna necessarily help a hundred veterans in a, in, a, in a week. Maybe it's just one a day, and that that's fine. And when you, you know. think about it, it's also these are the individuals that when you were in trouble. This is who you called. When the nation needed somebody to defend it, this right. is who was called. To be right. able to then turn around and say, well, I have a problem right. and I have a weakness, right. goes con completely contradictory to their entire image, self-image, mm -hmm. um, and it really takes a, a strong type of person to be able to come to grips with that. And it's not an overnight, right. it is oh, look at right. that, that's right. right. Um, right. You know, I, we make a, it's not a joke, but it's, it's a, so we have flyers on our tables about PTSD and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, trauma and, and all these different things. And nobody really comes up to the table and says, oh, by the way, I'm a paranoid schizophrenic. Right. Let me right. take that pamphlet. Right. Um, it's, it's one of those things of we're here for you. We can mm -hmm. supply mm -hmm. you the information. And if you need it, we're there. Mm -hmm. you don't want to talk, if you want to just come into the group and sit down and have a cup of coffee, have a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody's going to make inquiries. Nobody's going to force you to do anything. And then eventually... That now allows for the people to have a conversation with somebody who now starts to write stories about what they went through mm -hmm. and has been able to stand up in a room with people that are a lot older than them and admit to right. alcohol abuse. So you do uh, like consciousness raising or, or, or facilitating discussions. Yes. So, so people that are interested in, in being part of a group discussion which we do on in all different ways mm -hmm. I mean we have discussion groups on all different kinds of things so, so we do something with the writing group or we'll do something with an art group we'll do something with its right. women uh, veteran specific which is with Edie Meeks who was a nurse mm -hmm. in Vietnam mm -hmm. um, we're doing the PBS series we're doing the PBS the Ken Burns PBS series we're showing an episode of that a month and um, a bunch of Vietnam veterans sit around a couple times some of the guys didn't say a word the first episode right by the time right. the second episode came around they're opening up and talking about it. Right. And that, that's opening and that's up and wonderful. talking. That, that's right. what we want. We and, want it's, and it's non-judgmental. Nobody's there to say, you know, oh, what are you, an idiot? It, it, it's not that type of a conversation. It's, well, this was my you experience. You say that to me all the time. Though. This is true. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're, you're friends. Yes. <laughs> so that's different. How, what, what do you think the numbers are? Do, do, you, do you sit and talk about how many people are there in Putnam County or counties around us? How many people are we talking about, or do we really know how many people really need Paul might some know, what services? I would, what I would tell you is that if you look at the recent national statistics, it's 21 veterans a day are committing suicide. 21 veterans a day mm -hmm. are committing suicide. 
if you think of recently, you've had three individuals that were famous that committed suicide, and it's become this national issue. However, mm -hmm. 21 mm -hmm. veterans a day commit suicide. Right. Nobody and it's hears not anything on the front page except of the for paper the same way. except for the veteran community. Right. And I would tell you that in Putnam County, there have been veterans that have committed suicide. Mm -hmm. So whether or not it's 70 because we have a population of 100,000, or it's one. One is too mm -hmm, many. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And trying to raise awareness that this is a real issue. This is an issue that affects every community in the country. And we are not exempt just because we are a small community. It mm -hmm, does happen mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm. um, I actually think you have a lot of veterans probably living in Putnam County for for a number of residents. Mm -hmm. I think you probably have even a greater, it just seems to me, uh, it's a very patriotic county, yes. um, and there are a lot of veterans programs and services and events. Um, it just, I, I don't know whether there's a greater percentage, but if you can save a life and many lives, um, right. I'm sure you have, and you, you know, you never, you won't know it right. necessarily, right. but I'm sure you have. And, 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 and the variety that we're getting, I mean, I, on any given week, I can have a World War II veteran, I can have an Iraqi veteran that's just been home for two weeks. Uh, so, so it runs the whole gamut in Putnam mm -hmm. County. But the one thing that we have to be um, remember and think about quite often is, and it's the younger veterans, the veterans of this war, they're surviving wounds and injuries that would have killed my generation of veterans. So they're coming to home and we're going to have to answer that pretty soon. What are we going to do for them? There's going to be a lot more services they're going to need, a lot more care. Um, the, 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 the TBI level is triple what it was even 20 years ago. Um, guys surviving with multiple um, amputations that would have never survived. Mm -hmm. So that, that we're very concerned with. You see them, you know, they're slowly starting to trickle in the, the, um, the veterans of that era. Uh, but every, every week it's World War II to present. We, we see them all. Right. And, um, Just as we conclude, tell me how you feel about the vet to vet program. Has it has it helped you individually? Um, it does. I mean, how do you feel about it? It's it. I started as a volunteer, mm -hmm. um, and then I was asked to start to work for them, and then I have ended up being the program coordinator. Um, it has been one of the most rewarding things that I've done um, to think that it. it if you look at a veteran's community, it transcends every sex, every nationality, and every race. And it's the most inclusive and yet the most exclusive group to be a member of. And to be able to support that group is important. If you think, what's the most inclusive group? And it's the United States military, the people right. that have served right. in uniform. It, right. it transcends everybody. Right, and yet, absolutely. by the, the same token, it's a very small percentage mm -hmm, of the national mm -hmm. uh, population. And yet, to be able to serve them and to help them, just to move forward, right. is, is one of the greatest honors that I can right. do. And Carl, I assume? Yeah, well, I, I, I think with the vet to vet program, what it's enabled me to do with my office is expand, go out, mm -hmm. um, be in the community more, um, find, you know, meet more veterans. Uh, I, I think the outreach is the most important. And I'm not saying this, when, when I took over my office, nobody really knew where it was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now um, we're out in the public, we're out in the community, um, people know about us, um, and that alone draws veterans in. Right. So the more information we can get out to the veterans, right. that alone is a win. And that's what we're tool. doing this program for, and I know yeah. there's a lot of information there. I want to thank both of you, John and Carl, for being here today. I want to thank the audience, and if you have any questions, uh, either call me at the office, 914-941-1111, or we have wonderful contact information on the vet to vet program. So uh, thank you very much for watching. Have a good evening.